This is One on One. Selwyn Rabb is the author of Five Families, The Rise, Decline, and Resurgence of America's Most Powerful Mafia Empires, New York Times bestseller. Good to see you. I've been fascinated by you for years. A good reason. Yeah. I love your uh, modesty, too. Here's my question. Why do you think we, so many of us, are fascinated by the mob? Well, one reason is the uh, aura of glamour. Especially it was Hollywood has also helped produce and generate about the mob. And it's a vicarious kick. You look at these people, they don't really work hard. Some of them make a lot of money. They have plenty of women. It's a great life to a lot of people. And it's also the idea that it's uh, consistency. Mm. It's been with us so long, mm. at least 50 to 60 years. And it's become part of the fabric of our life. So we're in New York, we're taping in New York. The quote unquote five families back in the day in the 70s and 80s when they were really powerful. Where are they today? Well, they're, they're wounded. They're severely wounded, but they're not mortally wounded. And they have uh, one thing you have to remember about why the mafia continues to exist so long is that it's a mirror image of American capitalism. They, they latch on to whatever is working. Like today, it's internet, internet gambling. And it's actually made them more money than the old fashioned way where they had, uh, where they had, uh, you had a, a gambling parlor or a pool right. room. It, it's more modern. And the bread and butter of uh, the American mafia has always been gambling and loan sharking. They're symbiotic. A lot of people who gamble with them then need a loan shark. So it works terrific. The and rates they, are still the same? You, well, yes. And it's fa all they do is modernize. You know, years ago, when you needed a telephone and you needed a teletype, they did that. Today, they don't need that. They can go on internet. And it's even better. All the bets are mm. made out, uh, out, of the, out of the country. South America and elsewhere. And there's no way the IRS or anybody can even check on them. So they're thriving more than ever on gambling. Remind people, as we are, in fact, here in the heart of Manhattan, the impact, particularly in the 70s and 80s, that the mafia had on, and continues to have on, because the impact remains, on building costs, well, on garbage, uh, construction. Just break that, break that down for people so they understand, well, as opposed to, hey, listen, they're not hurting anybody. You know, they, they, they don't hurt civilians. That is a crock. What we didn't realize that for over 60 years, mainly due to J. Edgar Hoover's inactivity and didn't want to tackle them, is they were picking all our pockets on clothes, on garbage collection, on construction, on food. Whatever we did, they had a piece of it. And they thrived on it. Um, so that's what kept them going. And the public didn't know. And you find that both the press and the government were fairly indifferent. When I used to complain to people at City Hall about the mob running the Fulton Fish Market, they said, if we crack down, where are the restaurants going to get their fish tomorrow? It was that That kind was the reaction of, of government. That was the government sort of being aloof and not interested in it. And we and in the media? And saying it wasn't our problem. I'm sorry for interrupting. And we in the media? Why did mm -hmm. we turn a blind eye until, I would argue, uh, John Gotti, and he became fascinated by him, but I don't even know how objectively well, my, we covered them. My experience was that they were only interested in the murders or the deaths yes. or, or what John Gotti's socks were. Or crazy Joe Gallo down at Umberto's. Yeah, but, we'll be there for that, or yeah. Joe Colombo But they weren't Columbus. interested in the economic aspect. Because the more substantive too, stuff. Well, because it was very hard to get. It was very hard to investigate. And uh, like everybody else, even uh, newspapers and TV, it, it meant an investment. And you weren't sure what the produce was going to be. Yeah. But the real threat, and we're lucky we escaped, unlike what happened in Italy, was the mob's um, interest in taking control of politics. Of the government. Yeah. Well, you know, well just in Palermo, one, and I was well, in Palermo back in the day, they, they, took, they controlled the government. Well, they controlled a lot of big cities, New York, Boston, Chicago, Philadelphia. And uh, an aspect of this was that in New York, for many years, they ran Tammany Hall. And if you wanted to get the Democratic nomination for mayor in New York, you had to go to Frank Costello or somebody. Go back across the river where I'm born and raised in Newark, New Jersey. The mayor of my city when I was a young boy, you, you know what I'm saying right away. All the, mafia the mayors were convicted. But the, but the mafia controlled 
Hugh Adonisio, who was the mayor, lost in 1970 to Ken Gibson, you can look it up, went to jail for taking bribes from the mob for city contracts. It was commonplace, was it not? Precisely. And we're lucky that unlike in Italy, where the Christian Democratic Party leaned on uh, the mafia to produce the, produce the votes in Sicily. So we escaped. They were interested, mm. in, but they never succeeded. And we're lucky about that. Let me ask you, are you fascinated by the non... That, uh, are you fascinated by organized crime outside of the mafia? I mean, Colombian mob, Russian mob, are you fascinated by that? Well, well, the distinction is this. They come and they go. They don't last. They don't understand the culture of America. One of the things that made the mafia in, in America so powerful was that they understood our culture. And they had a gen billion genius, criminal genius, Lucky Luciano, who invented them. Now, you, sure, they're into narcotics. There are other people that have rivals. But if you take out one of the heads of the other families, they disappear. Mm. The mafia continues because Luciano... Uh, Who brought the commission together, the five well, families? Well, not just the commission, but the idea that the family was paramount. Everybody else could be sacrificed. But the organization had to exist and continue to exist. And that's what distinguished them from the Jewish mobs, the uh, Irish mobs, the Latin mobs, the black mobs. They had one leader. That leader goes... The organization goes. So let me ask you this. As we enter 20, 2020, and this will be seen in 2020, I say Trump and a mob, you say? Well, he acts, he liked to be a mob boss. He acts like a mob boss. Did he have relationships, well, business relationships with people in organized crime involving his, frankly, well, business the, activities? Well, the problem in New York, where he operated mainly, and in, don't forget also his gambling, if you were a contractor in New York or a developer, there was no question that you had to deal with the mob. Okay. Now he, but you didn't have to have Roy Cohen as your lawyer, who was the mob lawyer. <laughs> well, is that is that just a coincidence? I'm well, just he asking. was his mentor. He helped. He taught him. Okay. Taught him what? He taught him how. Well, he taught him always attack, never be defensive. But the idea was very simply is that he was in effect. Let's be honest about Trump. He was no different than the other developers. They all said, well, listen, I have nothing to do with the construction unions or the construction contractors. So they all sloughed it off that way. That's one of the reasons. Look, Trump was investigated by the FBI and a lot of other people, but they never laid a hand on him because he never had a direct result. He never had a direct contact with mafiosa. Mm. That's the distinction. Before he could farm it out. Yeah. Before I let you go, um... I just add, and you just ruined something for me because I told you uh, as we're doing this show, the Irishman's being talked about a lot. It'll be talked about in 2020 as well. You, you just said to me, it's made up. Now I'm a student of history. I'm watching Frank Sheeran, the Irishman, Jimmy Hoffa, right? Well, Hoffa existed, but Sheeran Hoffa existed, but but Frank's well, I don't want to give away the movie, go see it yourself. You say historically, not it, accurate. It's good, it's good entertainment, Is but it it's history? lousy history. Lousy history? Because Sheeran didn't do any of the things he did that he claims to have done. It's all malarkey, as um, <sighs> Mr. Biden would say. <laughs> and, that, you know, it's made up. He claims yeah. he killed... He always claims, like, he claimed he killed Joey Gallo. He didn't kill Joey Gallo. Joey got down in Umberto's the in night Umberto's of his birthday. in the 70s. How, how about this one? The movie closest to portraying mob life, mafia life, actually, was it, in fact, Goodfellas? Uh, pretty close, but uh, even that was exaggerated because um, the hero in that story could never be a mobster because he was, he only had, uh, at that time, you had to have... You're talking about Henry Hill. Yeah, Henry Hill had a, to, to get into the mob to be uh, inducted, both your parents had to had be to of be Italian Italy. origin, right. his weren't. But it's a bit exaggerated, but it's pretty close. Sopranos but the real, for listen, it's, it's, the real uh, movie that made the mob in America was The Godfather's. And uh, again, it was so powerful as an example of how it inspired people to mm. become mobsters was Sammy the Bull Gravano, who was the underboss of John, John Gotti, Gotti when right? he was running the Gambino family. And as a teenager, he went to see the movie and he was so electrified, he didn't realize how important it was. It got him to become a mobster. So in, in that <sighs> sense, they've adapted. They took the, God, they took the Godfather movies and even took the uh, musical theme and, and played it at their weddings, at their uh, every event. Uh, Mr. Rob, I want to thank you for joining us.
you are a great historian, and we learned a lot from you, and we appreciate you joining us on One on One. Thank you. Good to be here. This is One on One. I'm Steve Adubato. Catch you next time. Thank you, my friend. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET Studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by RWJ Barnabas Health, New Jersey Sharing Network, New Jersey Resources, the law firm of Gibbons PC, United Airlines, MD Advantage Insurance Company, Guarini Institute for Government and Leadership at St. Peter's University, and by Kessler Foundation. Promotional support provided by Tap Into TV and by Jaffe Communications. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.